Thank, welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. As a quick reminder, just make sure that you are keeping your microphone on mute during the meeting unless you are speaking, um, just to make sure that we keep things as quiet as possible and we can hear all of the great things that our amazing panelists have to say. Uh, we're just going to give people a couple more minutes to join in, but in the meantime, please do feel free to introduce yourselves briefly in the chat. Tell us a little bit about where you're calling in from. Uh, what brings you to the higher ed action team? If this is your first higher ed action team meeting, welcome. And also would love to know that so we can get to know you a little bit better. And we'll get started in just a few moments. And thanks everybody for sharing where you're calling in from. Nice, we've got some nice geographic representation. This is awesome. From Miami to Oregon and everything in between. We need some more like middle central US. We'll work on that for next time but we're doing pretty well so far. So thank you all so much for being here. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to go ahead and largely because I'm super excited to speak to these panelists and go ahead and start introducing them. So um, what I'm gonna do is I'll just read each of their bios so for everybody and they're all gonna have an opportunity to tell us a little bit more about themselves, especially whatever didn't make it into their bio um, shortly after. So. I'll begin by introducing Alex Harris, and she is a reporter who covers climate change for the Miami Herald, including how communities throughout South Florida are adapting to a changing world. She believes that effective communication, not only of the science of climate, but also the stories of those that are directly impacted by it, is critical to effectively respond to the threat of climate change. Alex resides and works in Miami and is committed to increasing climate literacy and inspiring action through her award-winning reporting. If she's not outside reporting on or enjoying the outdoors, you can find her inside playing Dungeons and Dragons. And you can keep up with her writing by following her at, at Harris Alex C on Twitter. And I'll make sure to put those um, into the chat as well. So welcome, Alex. Next up, we've got Isaiah Hernandez. He, he is the creator of Queer Brown Vegan, which is an educational platform where he creates accessible environmental education content. He believes that the climate crisis is an educational crisis, and we need different forms of educators that don't exist within edu institutions. Through visual illustrations, graphics, and videos, he has grown a community of over 100,000 like-minded environmentalists to engage in the discourse of the climate crisis. He seeks to provide a safe space for other like-minded environmentalists to engage in the discourse of the current climate crisis. Isaiah is currently bi-coastal, and I guess we should ask him which of the two coasts he's on right now, <laughs> splitting his time between New York and Los Angeles. He loves foraging in his spare time, and you can keep up with what he's up to by following at Queer Brown Vegan on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. Last but certainly not least, Flannery Winchester is CCL's Senior Director of Communications. In her role, she guides CCL's internal and external communications, which includes everything from email newsletters to building relationships with journalists in the national media. Flannery came to CCL after content and marketing roles at an email marketing agency, an international software company, and a local women's magazine in Atlanta. When she's not working, she's probably gardening, reading, or spending time outside with her dogs. You can keep up with Flannery's work by following at Flannery KW on Twitter or just following the CCL blog that she helps to run that show. So with that, welcome. Thank you all of you for joining tonight. We're so excited to speak to you. So I guess we'll just dive right in and tell us a little bit more about yourselves, um, especially anything that didn't make it into the bio, something that'll help us um, maybe understand how you came to this point in your career and what brings you um, here tonight. So Alex, do you want to kick us off? Yeah, sure. So thank you guys for having us tonight. I'm really excited to be here talking. Um, so I guess since we have kind of a higher ed audience in the room, um, I studied journalism and sustainability studies. I tried to dual major because I wanted to try to make sure that my future journalism was as informed as possible. Um, I didn't study a hard science, which the scientists I interview, one of which is on this call, sometimes give me a hard time about, but I feel like it's really important to understand systems and how the world sort of works and the connections you can make in your reporting and also your science communication and teaching. So that was a really important part of um, how I got to where I am and how I look at and understand the world around. Thank you, Alex. Isaiah, how about you? Yeah. Um, hey, everyone. Um, I'm an environmental educator. I went to UC Berkeley to get my environmental science degree. 
um, and I entered the workforce. I ended up applying for grad school, got in, and then I told myself I can't afford this, so I just dropped out and just said I'm going to do something else that life will hopefully lead me to somewhere and created this online educational account to talk about climate issues just because I felt that I was wasting my environmental degree for nothing and I was just like might as well just speak about it online like you know um, and throughout my life I've kind of have always had this passion for sustainability, creativity, uh, marketing and environmentalism and I just really wanted to find a career that was truly aligned with me and you know hopped around a lot of um, jobs and finally asked myself like you know, being a full-time freelance content creator in the digital era where a lot of Gen Z and millennials um, dominate the space, I would say, um, it's been a very unique time for me and I'm very privileged to be here today. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. And Flannery, what about yourself? Yeah, I'll um, just add uh, that the way that I came to CCL was through, um, being a volunteer. So my bio um, doesn't doesn't include that like piece of the story, but I um, the first thing that I ever did as a as a CCL volunteer was um, to attend the local chapter event here in Atlanta. Um, and everybody was handwriting letters to our senators, which I had never done before. Um, and I just thought that was so snazzy. Uh, and but part of the reason that I even showed up at that event was because I was determined to do climate work, um, even if nobody would pay me for it yet. <laughs> so um, I had actually changed jobs to one that was less less demanding during the day so that I would have energy and, you know, attention outside of work to devote to climate stuff. And so, um, so that was part of how I started that journey was I just kind of aimed myself at it, even though um, there was not there was not even a paycheck in sight. Um, and so uh, so that's how I got sort of in the loop. And then I volunteered with um, for CCL for two more years um, and then was hired on staff in, uh, in 2017. So this summer will be my five-year anniversary um, on staff with CCL. So that's just a little more background um, about my professional setup. Awesome. Thank you for that context, Landry. And I think it's such a good reminder also of the role that volunteer organizations can play in giving folks a space to develop professionally, um, an outlet for overall angst and anxiety around climate, which is very real these days, and also an opportunity to just connect with other like-minded folks and leverage your skills, whether that's professionally as a career or as something that you do in your spare time, um, if you can find it. So with that, uh, great context and great insight into all of you. I'd love to ask you, Isaiah, what drew you to the climate movement? Like there are all of these different environmental topics um, you can and do speak about, but what is it about climate specifically that interests you and keeps you in this space? Yeah, I would always say that I've always had a curiosity for environmentalism and, you know, part of my foundation of work is rooted in environmental justice. I, you know, grew up in a low-income community in Los Angeles, lived off food stamps, lived in affordable housing, and at a young age recognized like, you know, living in poverty, like the injustices I was living in today. And something that I had a really hard time understanding is like how my, how I saw myself as an environmentalist, because when I opened the textbook, I didn't see myself in those pictures. When I saw Discovery Channel or Nat Geo, I didn't see myself. I didn't, I didn't see the possibilities of like me being an environmentalist and traveling and talking about the world or conservation. And so I think my curiosity to get in trouble, to challenge professors, to challenge teachers in the classroom got me um, in trouble a lot for saying questions. But I think that that really led my curiosity to recognize like, you know, there is this myth that people of color, working class people of color don't care about the environment, but that's not true. We truly care about the environment. It's just that our cultural stories have been attempted to be severed through the dominant narrative that is put out there. And so I, I would say that when I learned about environmental justice in high school and, and worked the local EJ org, I told myself, if I want to really help and educate my community around me, like I need to enter academia and put myself through this institution to recognize and to give those resources um, to low-income communities who never had 
the privilege to learn about these topics or get to see themselves in these spaces. So I would say that it was really rooted in injustice for me to become a climate educator um, and to be in this space to hopefully empower others so they don't need to go through the same challenges or conflicts that they felt that they never saw themselves in this movement. Really, really powerful motivator and definitely such deeply important work. Um, I think also for me, even growing up, not seeing young people in this space made it really difficult to feel like I had agency as a human being to speak up for environmental and climate work. And I think in addition to the incredible work that you're doing in sort of elevating the voices of queer people, of BIPOC people who have historically been marginalized and left out of this conversation, you're also providing a platform for young people to look up to and say, you know, I don't have to be super far after graduation to make an impact. I can be making an impact right now. So thank you. Flannery, I'm going to turn to you with apologies for the fact that you have spoken about this already <laughs> ad nauseum on your great Citizens Climate Radio um, episode. What made you explore communication as a career path? Sure, yeah. Um, I I don't think I actually specifically addressed this on the podcast, so this is a little little more behind the scenes. Um, but I writing was just always my strongest skill in school, um, and I actually thought for a while that I would go into um, like book editing. That was kind of my I was like, oh, I'll do that. Um, and so I had an internship at a children's book publisher in Atlanta one summer during college um, and another children's book publisher in Charleston one spring during school. I went to College of Charleston in South Carolina. Um, but then my first job after school was a was for a women's magazine. Um, and so that took me more in like a comms and PR sort of direction. Um, but yeah, that was just a, a skill set that I was always strong in. Um, but sometimes, sometimes I think that if I could go back that like I might have just defaulted to uh, like reading and writing and editing because I it was it was a concrete thing that I was like oh you can be a writer or be an editor like those those mapped very clearly to jobs that I could conceptualize um, and sometimes now I think if I go back if I could go back like I could have been a scientist if someone had just said like well <laughs> these are the types of things that scientists do like and you care about these things like I could have I could have done that um, so I think in some ways it was like you know, you can't be what you can't see. And all I could sort of see was like, I could, this is what I could do with these skills. And I didn't know really what else I could do with the other skills that I was, that I was learning in school. Um, but yeah, so I was, I was a strong writer um, and went in that direction. And I think the thing that was, I, my major was in English. Um, and I think the thing that was helpful for me was to just like, think of it as uh, like, I'm just going to get I'm just going to get some skills. I'm just going to get like a solid base. And then whatever it is that I care about or am passionate about, I'm going to figure out how to apply those skills to that area. Um, and, uh, and luckily, you know, English and writing and strong communication, like that's crucial in really any field. And so, um, so that's kind of what led me here. That's awesome. And I love that just little snippet of like, I couldn't be what I couldn't see. That's so powerful, so very much connected to Isaiah's work as well. Um, yeah, I felt that. Definitely want to encourage everybody in the audience as folks say something that really resonates with you, feel free to like respond, drop it in the chat, give them a little heart or a thumbs up or something. Um, we love to get your feedback as we go as well. And we'll also have some time for questions at the end. So be thinking about those things. Um, I'd love to open this up to like all of you. What's the most useful or applicable class you ever took and why? And maybe let's go to Alex first. So uh, I know I just talked about, you know, the way that systems thinking is what I really enjoyed learning about in college um, when I think about the climate related courses. But I was I had this conversation with my editor the other day, so I'm glad you asked this. Um, I took a class in college called environmental economics. And for like a second there, I thought I wanted to be an economist because this class was so interesting, but it, it just gave me a whole new way of looking at the world. Uh, the, I think the first question we walked in, uh, our professor was like, okay, how much is an acre of forest worth? And people were like, oh, it costs this, this, and they guessed, and he's like, well, what are you basing the value off of? Are you basing it off of the timber you could turn into furniture, the bees that are pollinating in there, the animals, the oxygen production, the fire retardant abilities, 
And it was just such a way of thinking about the world is like, and it, yes, it is rooted in capitalism, but it also is a really interesting way of thinking of things. Like we can find value in places that we traditionally haven't looked. And as the world is changing with climate change, we are kind of being forced to look back and think of what are the other pieces of value we can find in this? And maybe how do we make a case monetarily, logically, however you want to say it, that these things are more are really valuable beyond just like the spiritual and environmental and emotional connection we have to things. And that class actually came into play last year when the state of Florida, um, there was a new university organization group with agriculture, they called it Climate Smart Pack. And it was a bunch of farmers who wanted to get together and say, we wanna be a part of the solution. Let's talk about uh, ecosystem services, which is the concept of saying that, you know, if you don't mow down that lawn, if you don't uh, tear down those trees, we'll pay you money to hold it and carbon farm. And I was so prepared for that conversation because of that class. Um, but it also broadened up the whole conversation, right? Like, how, how, how am I looking at the world? Am I looking at it through, I only see value this way, or is there a much broader way I could be looking at this? And what am I missing? Um, which I think has informed lots of stories and lots of, you know, parts of my life ever since. I'm sure some really exciting stories come out of that. So we'll come back to that. <laughs> Isaiah, so what was the most useful class that you ever took? Um, you know, it's really interesting. I think the first two years of undergrads, like a lot of undergrad students here, you have to take your leader courses. So like, you know, science, like physics, chem, math, economics, like it all, all matters. It all, it's all interconnected. But I would say like my intro to environmental science methodologies course, because they actually taught you how to write a research proposal. At the time I was a, I was a, like a research associate because I think Berkeley itself, like is a very big, big on research. And so I think by sophomore, by the end of my sophomore year, I got into a lab and then, you know, trajectory of like, you're going to have to write your senior thesis on the research that you're doing right now in the lab you're in. And so it was very unique because I think that for so long, I was so intimidated by research articles. And I always tell this to people like, you know, I love academia. It has pros and cons, but when it comes to like really summarizing those articles and trying to summarize it, it is, it is very difficult, especially when you're trying to communicate that with the general public, because a lot of the words that they use don't really make sense or you're trying to kind of interconnect it to general speaking. And so I would say that in now, in what I learned and what the content I do today in trying to break down all of these science, scientific concepts, like, you know, biocultural conservation and, um, you know, citing these researchers that have written about it, I've been able to apply that same um, structure of like, how do you write a summary? Like what, what tables do you look at? Like, how do you get the quickest information? And I feel that um, because of that, like research experience side on that, and I feel that I've become more comfortable in reading research articles and also got to learn how to use, I think Sci-Hub where you can get free research articles um, without the proxy, because even then I confirmed with other scientists that they don't even get paid for you paying for the articles on those stores. So it's like, you might as well email them, which I usually do, or I just, you know, get it from Sci-Hub. Nice. Yeah, the publishing game and paywall is such a hassle. Um, so definitely reach out to researchers directly, always eager to share their work um, without having to go through a paywall. Uh, Flannery, how about you? What was the most useful class you ever took? Um, well, I'll just say the class Alex was describing makes me want to go back. Like, I'm like, let me sign me up for that class. Like, that sounds so interesting. Um, the, the one that I um, always think of is a class that I took my senior year of college, um, which was called Modern English Grammar, which sounds like Dullsville, I'm sure, to many of you. But um, we, you know, we all like learn about the, the rules of commas and like the technical stuff like early on in school like I think I first we first really did serious grammar in like eighth grade um but who remembers who remembers we don't remember um and uh but yet we're still like we're writing all the time we have to you know convey things clearly and um and so that I felt like was a really critical class for me at a time when my brain was finally able to like focus on it and grasp the rules and then actually like put it into action in my career. Like I, I immediately turned around and literally months later was um, 
was editing at this magazine and like explaining to other people like there's a reason that there's a comma here and not here and there's a reason why I'm, I'm going to tell you even though you're the editor of the magazine I'm going to tell you to take it out <laughs> um and so that I have always appreciated that um that class um and it, it's made me think a lot about how much like sometimes when we do like accelerated track stuff in school like we end up getting to um getting to content that we're like not quite really ready for and sometimes if you revisit stuff later on you can uh i think absorb it better and like put it to better use and that's that's very much how i felt about that that grammar class i definitely learned to find new connections when you revisit things that you were exposed to when you were like eight or nine you're like why didn't they explain it to me this way like it makes so much sense now <laughs> So Alex, you already hinted at sort of your interesting take on finding the stories that are worth telling, but what's the most exciting story you've ever reported on and why were you so jazzed to get to write about it? So that is a hard question because the definition of exciting um, changes depending on what topic. So I haven't always written about climate change. When I came to the Herald, I probably should have tucked this into the first question, but um, when I first started in journalism, I started working at the Miami Herald covering crime and cops and shooting and everything that happened. And then eventually worked my way to cover climate change, which is where I wanna be. Uh, but one of those stories I did before I got over here was about a man who had a pet alligator that he fed uh, Oreos and pizza and Costco rotisserie chickens. And it was named Gwendolyn. And every holiday he still dresses her up in costumes and texts me pictures. So nothing beats that except for potentially uh, my very first climate story I ever did, which was about an octopus. Uh, it was rose up through a storm drain and ended up in a parking garage in Miami Beach. Um, you may have heard of this. It's the only viral climate story I've ever done. <laughs> and it was technically before I was the climate change reporter, um, and, but it was a good piece of leverage to get me this job. Um, and now I'm glad that you guys have seen that story because on this call is someone who dressed up as an octopus and carried a laminated version of this story into a public meeting. And that's why Greg is my favorite reader ever because I've never had anyone cosplay any of my stories before and it was so exciting. But that piece specifically was really helpful both as someone who's trying to get into climate change. Yes, the soup, but um, I, if you have a picture of that, Greg, I have a save in my desktop. You could pop one in the chat. I think everyone would love it. Uh, but no, I love that story because it's such an easy and, and really effective way to communicate to people that climate change is here, it's in your backyard. It's not something that's happening 50 years from now, it's something that's happening now. Um, and there was also like a school of fish, you know, and this sort of stuff is not unusual. It happens to have, you know, aquatic life in your garage in places like Miami Beach when there's a big flood. Um, but it was just so compelling and it was a story that really captured people's imaginations. Uh, and that was just a really cool story for me. And there's been five years of more interesting stories, but those hold special places in my heart, I think. And I could go on for a long time about those other stories, but I will leave it at the, the octopus in the parking garage. That has got to be like the greatest one-liner pitch for a story ever. Like your editor must have been thrilled when you walked in with that idea. Uh, that's just fantastic. Such a great like tangible impact of, of the impacts that we're seeing from sea level rise here in, in South Florida. All right. Um, so again, as a reminder to the audience members, be thinking about questions you'd like to ask our panelists. We'll have a few minutes. Um, but I'm curious, what's what does somebody who is interested in climate communication absolutely need to know? Like, what's the most important thing they should they should be aware of? And I think any of you can just jump in when you're ready. I um, I jotted down some thoughts on this before, um, and I wrote down that it's important to know that what makes makes sense to you about climate or what motivates you on climate may not work for everyone. Um, like a crucial part of effective communication is thinking about your audience. Um, so, if, you know, you might like you yourself might hear the information from the latest like the IPCC report and go, okay, let's fix that. That sounds bad. Um, but others might not necessarily be be moved by those like the facts or figures or the numbers. Um, other people might need to hear about like how it affects something they're personally involved in, like, you know, fishing or skiing or the impacts on their the people in their particular community. Um, so I think that's, that would be my biggest piece of advice is just keep in the forefront of your mind whenever you're starting to communicate with, with someone about climate, like who is my audience and what will resonate with them. Uh, for me, my favorite thing to keep in mind whenever I'm trying to communicate about climate is that your audience is not dumb. 
They just don't know as much as you do. And I think that's a really important difference. You don't talk down to people because everyone in your community has knowledge that you don't. Just because you don't understand the most efficient route to deliver packages in your neighborhood or how to fix the sink doesn't make you stupid. And because someone else doesn't understand exactly why methane is more potent in a worse greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide doesn't mean they're stupid. You just have different knowledge bases. And I constantly have to remind myself that every single time I say anything, like, how, do, does everybody know this? And you know, if you write about a thing or communicate about a thing for a long time, you kind of forget that everybody doesn't know what adaptation means or why two degrees is important. And I have to constantly remind myself in every single story. Like I was editing one earlier this evening, working with a different editor than I normally do. And I wrote that, you know, climate change could have devastating impacts economically and environmentally in Florida. And she said, how do we know that? And I was like, okay, I should, you know, link to a couple of previous stories that I've written over the last five years. Um, maybe send them to my editor so she can read them, uh, but also write it out. So it could affect housing prices. It could affect where we can live. It could affect the health and um, health of our, our, human, our, our fellow humans with uh, what diseases are traveling around or exacerbate existing conditions. It's just break it down every single time. Simple, not condescending. And to me, that's just like, that's the essence of science communication in general. Yeah, I, I think I would say like always um, double check sources and understand like if you're going to source something to ensure like who funded that study because there's been even times where I've talked about simple conversations about like what is more sustainable between a certain product. I believe it was the dishwasher versus washing your dishes in a dishwasher versus sink. And I found several studies. In one of the studies, actually, it was funded by a company that, you know, found out that their their machines are much more eco-friendly. And in these discussions, I was like talking with people of like evaluating like what is the best source. I think like collectively making sure that you're not giving, you're challenging the study and you're challenging your audience to say, you know, you don't, just fall for one thing just because it's published by a corporation it was funded by a corporation and you're like okay now now i know everything right um and the other thing is i give a lot to my audience the cultural and lived experience standpoint i know that it is super important to understand like both like western science indigenous science are at the same wavelength that they should coexist at the same time so with that being said i do tell people like through my cultural experiences through my lived experiences like what that looks like specifically when we talk about environmental contamination right i talk about environmental racism which is like pollution due to corporate and racist policies that have been implemented in cities and i talk about my lived experiences of like how is it like to live near you know the metro link in los angeles everyone says they love public transportation but all the NIMBYs in Los Angeles would never want to live right next to a train because they know the amount of pollution it causes and noise pollution it does to your body. So <clears throat> I think that that kind of gives um, people to kind of ask themselves like, hmm, what about like, you know, I grew up in this environment that didn't have access to healthy food. Is that a food desert? And then they start to make those connections and then you can start kind of building with them to get kind of involved in the climate movement. Awesome. Thank you all so much for that. Um, I'd love to open it up to questions from the audience, if anybody has any. Please feel free, you can raise your hand and unmute. Or you can drop it in the chat and I'll gladly read it out for you. Maybe while people are, there we go, Abby, thank you for breaking the ice. Abby would like to know, do organizations like CCL hire right out of undergrad or do you need more experience? Yeah, I can speak to that. Um, at CCL, we, I mean, it depends on the position, obviously, but um, I have someone on my team who um, just graduated from undergrad last spring. So she had a few months of, uh, a few months of experience, um, but she had, she had three years of organizing and volunteering experience with CCL. So um, that was, that weighed heavily um, in the process. So um, I think it, it depends, but CCL definitely does, um, does hire out of undergrad. I was wondering, um, so in terms of climate communication, I'm, I'm having difficulty 
with um, with finding the right time to communicate to other people about climate change and how how to find a balance between just talking to people about it but not overwhelming people with information and how do you find this balance and trying to still weave it into conversations and wondering what your um, opinions are. I think part of it is you just have to embrace being that friend. Uh, Cause I, I mean, I communicate it professionally but obviously personally, uh, my friends know that I will just lean in sometimes and be like, go on a little bit of a doom and gloom spiral if I have one of those days. Um, but it's just, you know, I think it's the secret to any kind of communication, right? Like there's one way you behave around your friends versus how you behave in other parts of society. And when you think about relevant climate communication, relevant is the word here. If someone really loves sports, you talk about, you know, you know, it's making it hotter outside more days of the year and it's harder to do outdoor sports uh, because it's just dangerously hot sometimes. Doesn't that suck? We can't watch baseball uh, in, in 70 years because you'll only be able to go outside I may have to shift the opening day or something like that. You have to find things that are relevant to them. And, you know, that friend who's really into baseball and the shifting opening day may make a difference to him is going to be different than the friend who loves to snorkel and is interested in the fate of coral reefs. I think if you keep it on the things that you know that person might be interested in and stay around that topic, uh, you're more likely to have them stay engaged and not just give you that glazed over look when you're like on minute four of your soapbox. At least that's what I try. I would say like, you know, as kind of with, if you use social media and you think about social media, because a lot of younger generations like Gen Z that are in college are starting to use TikTok and like Instagram to communicate what they're learning in their degree. I think that's a really great start. One thing that I kind of like would challenge is kind of bringing out climate comedy. I know that climate comedy has existed for some time already, but something that I've noticed and I've recognized that when I've done random skits or green screen um, animations about me, you know, doing a scenario of like, I wish I was at a plastic free grocery store from the 1950s and like reenacting a scene, people have found that so much more opening to start the conversation about like, what is the history of plastics? Like, where did plastics come from? Like, are they bad? Are they good? Like, how do we have this nuanced conversation? And I think that it's easy for a lot of my community to be like, you know, when you wrote about the gruesome report of the IPCC, like, I don't want to read it, Isaiah, because it's intense. But other people in my community are like, I love the lighthearted content you do because that allows me to manage my anxiety in a sustainable way for me to learn about that. So I would say that um, younger generations, from what I'm seeing, they're like very attracted to like comedic memes and things that get them there. Of course, it's not going to do the whole justice, right? But that's where collaboration comes from because then you get to cite research articles or articles written by climate writers in this space. And like, we are the ones who also rely on them as sources of information. And that's how you get them to have longer conversations. And it does take time. Um, it's not going to happen within a month. Great. Yes. And there's some great commentary in the chat also about the, the power of focusing on solutions rather than falling into the, the doom spiral, which I think is so tempting in the climate space. Um, and the very last question, um, I'll give this one to Isaiah from Patricia in the chat. How does your family feel about your powerful and empowering platform? P.S. You're awesome. I will extend that to all three of you. Thank you so much. And Isaiah <laughs> would love to hear from you on um, how you communicate out your great communication work with your family, like with these closer peers as well. Yeah, I think like my parents, they're from Mexico and like they always instilled, you have to go to college, you have to go to college. And my mom went to college in Mexico herself, but unfortunately when she immigrated here, she's deemed as quote unquote undocumented and was unable to practice. But she was actually my own, she's like my environmental educator, OG teacher, because she taught me how to write and speak in Spanish while I was learning in English. And she taught me a lot about her experiences growing up in a farm in Mexico and like why they were displaced and why they had to leave over the years. So I would say that it kind of gives them happiness. My mom joins my live streams awkwardly sometimes when I'm like having very professional conversations. I ask her to like not to join because she makes me nervous, um, but she really loves it. And she honestly was like, honestly, I just wanted you to have a good life and I want you to like be happy in your career. So 
I'm glad to see that. But again, it's really hard because like coming out of college, I was so stressed trying to find a job and I, I ended up working at this creative marketing agency. Something that Flannery was telling me like, you know, you, you don't, you end up in a different industry, you end up in a different career and then you don't know why, but ends up working out. I love that. I'm so here for the support of La Familia. I'm so thrilled to hear that and all the way here for embarrassing mom moments on your live streams. <laughs> That's fantastic. I think we should all have mothers who join our, our various work activities and um, try to embarrass us with their love and support. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Any last thoughts from the three of you before we wrap the panel portion and move on to a fun communication exercise? I, I think I'll just reiterate for folks that like um, sort of what Isaiah was just was just acknowledging that like a, a career is it is very hard to preview like oh here's where I'm gonna go <laughs> like here's where I'm gonna end up unless you get a very specific kind of training it's it's not likely that your that your path will be mapped all the way out um, and so I just wanted to say to the young folks on the call like that's okay. Like take, take a first step and see what you learn and get more information about yourself and about the world from, from where you are on, on your path. And then take the next step with all that information in mind. And, and, uh, so I guess just don't like freak yourself out trying to choose the perfect career at the, you know, the beginning of your journey. Um, just, you know, just take a step and let it, let it unfold. Um, and it's okay if you don't have it all figured out right in this moment because it will it will come. Um, my story is, or my comment, I guess, is more about like activism. Um, I had a really, I was working on a story uh, about the anniversary of the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, sh Douglas shooting recently, and I was talking to David Hogg, and he told me that the greatest lesson he's learned in recent years is about activism, and it's about you know the marathon, not a sprint thing, is not a joke. Um, it's fine if you need to take a break. If you are getting overwhelmed with all of the attention you're putting into climate change uh, communication or activism, or if it's your day job, it's okay to feel like this is a lot because it is. And it is not your job alone to be the person who has to communicate this or solve this for everything in the world. You are working through CCL and I'm sure other methods to kind of build a network of strong communicators and advocates who can sort of keep working on this it is not just you by yourself and it is healthy and good for you to rest. And uh, it is one of the most revolutionary things you can do is work when you can, take break when you can, it'll come back and you're a stronger and better advocate for taking time to yourself. Do not burn out, we need you, just take what you got. Yeah, I would say to like all the younger folks out there, like don't be afraid to take risks. Like I've publicly, I've talked about this on my platform just a few weeks ago, like, when I was an undergrad as a senior in 2018, like everyone, the conversation shifted from like, oh, what are you doing with research to what are you doing after graduation? And that's very stressful. I think a lot of undergrads do that a lot. I think that for what it's worth, like, you know, normalizing rejection is really hard. And I think that like, I told all my friends, so I got rejected from all the environmental NGOs when I originally applied in 2018. And all of them have told me straight up, a lot of interviews, you know, where, what does your portfolio look like? Like, and often at times there was a bit uncomfortable interviews. I just felt like I don't belong in this space. And I would say that, you know, rejection is one of the hardest things to learn, but it makes you stronger in a weird, in a weird way, but also not to be afraid to explore different avenues that are creating, because I think that you know, a lot of the times we see ourselves or we're like, oh my God, you've been doing this for X amount of years or X, you know, this, but all of our journeys, like we've all had to start, we've all been challenged, we've all been told that we're maybe not good enough to be in these spaces or we're not, um, you know, just lacking the skills or resources or mentors. And I, I want everyone to know, like, take advantage that there's people like us that are out here in these spaces willing to sit down or willing to like share you about our experiences and that you should never feel ashamed for asking for help on that end because I feel that I internalized it so much when I was in college to make it seem like I had everything together in my life when in reality I did not and I just didn't know what I wanted to do and, and that's okay I think that like at 21 at 20 or 21 22 23 like you shouldn't know what you want to do it, it takes time and that's okay much love for that <laughs> definitely 
helpful to be reminded of that, um, especially when we're an undergrad and still trying to figure our lives out. So thank you all so much for sharing a little bit about how you went about figuring your lives out, how you ended up where you are here. And I'm sure we'll get to hear more from you in the future about where you end up next and all the great, exciting things you continue to do in your careers in communication and climate. Um, so with that, just massive, massive thanks, huge round of applause um, from me. Thank you so much for being panelists on our first ever Climate Career Connections. So in the spirit of this series, um, I am hoping to use this in addition to an opportunity to get to know really exciting people doing amazing work in these sort of different themes um, and experiences. I'd also love it to be a space where us as young climate advocates can come together and practice really useful skills. And since today's theme was communication, I'd love for us to try our own hand at communication. Um, our panelists, I'm not sure if you're able to stay with us or drop off, but maybe you'll have one of the panelists in your own breakout room. But the goal with this exercise is to communicate a little bit more about what makes this world worth fighting for. So at CCL, we talk a lot about like wanting to save the world and needing to savor it first, like being able to really explicitly name what it is that we savor. But I think for young people, it is very much a fight. It is the fight of our lives and for our lives. So I'd love us to kind of channel that thinking and that energy and that momentum around climate to talk to each other a little bit about what it is in this world and your world specifically on a deeply personal level that is worth fighting for, is worth making a stand and taking a stand against climate change for. So I'll share with you all an example just to get the juices flowing and then I'll put you into breakout rooms for five minutes to share with one other person your personal story. So my personal story is that I live in Miami, Florida. I actually live at the gateway to the Everglades on the lands of the Tequesta, Seminole, and Miccosukee, who stewarded this absolutely incredible ecosystem for thousands of years before Europeans ever got here. And I also happen to be a first-generation immigrant. And I connected really deeply with the Everglades when we moved here because we were homesick. Like in Puerto Rico and in Cuba, we have like these vast expanses of green. And in South Florida, that wasn't so present. The Everglades was one of those places that we could go to and my family and I would go and camp. And it was a place where I discovered a real calling and passion for environmental activism and specifically for birds. Like I would actually go out on a weekend and have a great time getting bit up by mosquitoes, just trying to catch a glimpse of a rosy spoonbill. And seriously, if you've ever been to the Everglades in summer, you know that this is serious commitment. If you're standing out there at six in the morning getting bit up by mosquitoes on a day that's literally ranked as bloody, you really care about what you're doing. And I think that inspired me to pursue environmentalism more as a career path. And it taught me that there is so much incredible things in the Everglades that are worth protecting. Unfortunately, the Everglades is also ground zero for some of the most immediate impacts of climate change. You have sea level rise, that is directly impacting the health of these ecosystems and those birds that I grew up loving to watch. It's also directly impacting our drinking water because those of us who live here in South Florida get our drinking water from the groundwater that is recharged and filtered by the Everglades system. It happens to be a really critical part of our ecotourism infrastructure and tourism is a huge part of the Floridian economy. So by not acting on climate change, we are losing valuable ecosystems, we're threatening our own capacity to survive. We're threatening the economic backbone of our state. And that's, I think, something worth fighting for. So with that example, I'm going to put you all into some breakout rooms. And looks like we've got about 15 people. Great. All right, and I will see you all here in about five minutes and practice sharing your story with that other person. That's my story. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. Sandra, thank you so much for sharing a little bit more about your background. And I have a sense that this is the beginning of much more frequent participation in CCL, I hope. Um, sounds like you've got a lot, a lot to plug into, a great network to plug into. Does anybody want to share their story with the larger group? Uh, just want to hold some space to hear a little bit more about each of you, if you'd like to. All 
All right, no takers. Greg, yes, let's hear it, Greg. <laughs> yeah, I, I was. Uh, I had the the fortunate roll of the dice to be paired with Isaiah. Awesome. And uh, we both talked about nature deficit disorder and how we were both privileged enough to be exposed to nature early in life. My experience that I shared with him was how I learned how to, my grandfather uh, taught me, you know, how to fish or bluefish on the North shore of Long Island. I born and raised in Miami, but every summer I would go to Long Island, New York, where my parents are from, Brooklyn. And uh, I learned to fish, but also just being in this area where I'd spend the entire summer, aside from the fishing, I would just go and sit in the woods. And just being out there surrounded by these trees was, um, was um, what's the word I'm looking for? It was, it was, re, it was, it, it built me up, built me back up. And I do that now. I do that now in Colorado. I, I mountain bike and I'll climb up, you know, a couple thousand feet and then just be amid these uh, aspen trees, you know, just be in, in, in the wild. So, you know, what, 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 uh, what energized me or sort of made me connected to the earth as a young kid still does the same now. And uh, that was, you know, just one of many, many, many connections to nature that, that I enjoy. But I think that then the main thing that we both discussed as I, I, I both discussed is the, um, the sad and unfortunate situation of so many kids today that uh, are just in a situation where, like I said, they don't know what a strawberry looks like. You know, and uh, nature deficit disorder. They can name more cereal brands and video games than trees in their backyard, or birds for that matter. Right, Stephanie? I didn't know you were a birder. It's good to know. I'll send you some bird photos. Yes, please do. I welcome all bird bird content. So does Patricia also. I'm going to out her as a birder on here. And I hear that Alex would like to volunteer, Patricia. Only if you're comfortable sharing, would you like to share your story? I'm totally down and Alex can totally share. And my favorite bird is a great blue heron. <laughs> yeah, Patricia was telling me about um, the place she lives and the gorgeous history of it and or not the terrible history of it, but the gorgeous current um, reality of like all the birds and all the pollinators. We were talking about butterflies. I just, I, we just painted a picture of such a gorgeous place that's so worth saving and has generations of history behind it. It sounds like a really beautiful story. And knowing where Patricia is based, I have no doubt <laughs> that every bit of that story was 100% realistic, as fantastical as it may sound. Uh, it's a really beautiful part of the country. Great. Thank you all so much for participating in that and sharing your stories. I know that was very much an off-the-cuff communications exercise, but if you're going to hashtag be that friend, um, <laughs> you're going to have to get comfortable with sharing that story um, of what motivates you to fight this fight every day, even if it is somewhat spontaneous at a random outing with your friends. Um, so with that, I want to just wrap up really quickly, again, with a lot of gratitude and also a few very exciting announcements. I've been plugging this on our higher ed action team calls for the last couple of months, and I'm really excited to announce that our Internship and fellowship positions are officially live on the website. Starting today, you heard it here first. Please do go and apply. I know most of you on here from previous calls, and I know you would all be excellent candidates. So I strongly encourage you to go there. Next month, our monthly calls, as you may recall, happen every Monday on the first Monday of the month. Next month, rather than convening here in this higher ed space, um, I've actually coordinated with Tony Serna, who's CCL. Vice President of Organizational Strategy and is leading some of those conversations around um, CCL's big policy priorities and where we might go next um, in, in the coming years and provide resources for our volunteers for. We had some great opening conversations around this a couple months ago on this call, um, but I'd really love us to show up en masse to Tony's call and get to express our perspective, um, especially as college students, on what these priorities should be um, he leads a great call. It's a larger group of folks, but he knows that we are coming and is eager to incorporate more young voices in guiding that um, strategic discussion. So I think that'll be a great opportunity and that'll be on April 4th at the same exact time. So it's not adding another meeting to your schedule. We're just going to that one instead next month. And lastly, um, this Saturday is the monthly call and the 
speaker is Jennifer Carmen, who's a postdoc with the Yale program on climate change communication. So very much in theme, I did not plan this. This was not orchestrated at all. CCLers are just all of the same mind and know that climate communication is hugely important. Um, so if you are available on Saturday at 1 p.m. Eastern, I strongly encourage you to go check that call out. The Yale program on climate change communication produces some incredible communication materials that we use frequently here at CCL. And I'm sure she'd be a great, extremely knowledgeable person to hear speak. So with that, I will formally conclude our meeting, but do please feel free to stick around, um, especially campus leaders, if you have any questions or would love to touch base about anything. And even you guests, you're welcome to stay for just a little bit of open conversation for about 10 minutes. But thank you all again so much for coming out tonight. It just means the world to me to have this great group and these great panelists. So thanks again. <laughs>